morning, church family. Good morning. And a very warm welcome to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to all of you here in the sanctuary and to our online worshipers on this Palm Sunday. Very special welcome back to our choir director, Karen. Welcome, Karen. Our Good Friday service will be held at 10.30 a.m. The offering will be given to Presbyterian sharing and special envelopes will be provided so please ensure your name or offering envelope number is on it. Thank you. Next Sunday, you are invited to place flowers in memory of loved ones to brighten the sanctuary for our Easter service. If you would like the name of your loved one recognized in the bulletin, please provide the information to me by Thursday morning. And your tribute can then be taken home after the service. Today, there is a special birthday celebration. And our congratulations and best wishes goes out to Irene Livingston. So may God continue to bless your life, Irene, and I'd like you to come forward and I'd like to present to you on behalf of the congregation a beautiful outdoor pansy plant with all the little faces facing forward for you. <laughs> this is from love from the congregation. Bless you. puts us in the festive spirit for Palm Sunday. Friends, we're here to worship the Lord together and to remember that this week, beginning today on Palm Sunday, is a kaleidoscope of emotions, of joy and sadness, of excitement and, uh, and deep pain. It's a, it's a real, it's a, it's a real emotional roller coaster but I trust that we'll be able, by the grace of God, to enter into this week and ponder the deeper meaning of our Lord's death and His resurrection for us. So let's, if you're able, please stand and we will sing together, Holy, Holy, Holy. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Lo, your king comes to you. Humble and riding on a donkey. Now we can't march around the sanctuary today uh, with COVID issues, but we can raise our palm branches at least in one hand as we sing together, all glory, laud, and honor, 214.
we sing today, you can wave those palms. Let's pray. O oh, merciful God, we praise you today for your redemption of the world in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Today, long ago, Lord, he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was proclaimed Messiah and King by those who spread their garments and palm branches along his way. Let these branches be signs of his victory and grant that we who carry them and wave them this morning may follow Jesus all the way to the cross that dying and rising with him, we may enter into your kingdom through Christ who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And yet, O oh God, just like the people who greeted Jesus as he entered Jerusalem, and then just a few days later, cried out, crucify him. We are fickle people who often deny our Lord Jesus in our thoughts and words and actions. Remembering the events of Jesus last week, help us to see ourselves for what we are, sinners in need of a Savior. And praise God, we have, we have a Savior in Christ. And so, Lord, with humility and with honesty and with hope, hear us now as we confess our sins to you. Friends, let's pray together the prayer printed in our bulletin. O Lord, who on this day entered the rebellious city that later rejected you, we confess that our wills are as rebellious as Jerusalem's that our faith is often more show than substance, that our hearts are in need of cleansing. Have mercy on us, Son of David, Savior of our lives. Help us to lay at your feet all that we have and all that we are, trusting you to forgive what is sinful, to heal what is broken, to welcome our praises, and to receive us as your own. Amen. Friends, hear these words of the Lord from Psalm 118. Let those who fear the Lord say, His steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress I called on the Lord, and the Lord answered me. He set me free. The Lord is my strength and my song, he has become my salvation. I shall not die, but I shall live and retell the deeds of the Lord. Friends, in Christ, God answers us. God sets us free. In Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And in the spirit of that forgiveness, let us share the peace of Christ with each other. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And would you turn and greet one another and share his peace together. And peace to you, online friends. Our next hymn is number 216, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest.
Good morning. This is from John 12, verses 12 to 26. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now among those who went to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I just want to say a word about this special music that we're about to hear that Jonah will be singing. Uh, he looked at me. And this is something that our sister Karen uh, wrote, composed, and she's sharing with us for the first time. So we're so grateful for that. Bless you.
thank you, Karen and Jonah, for preaching the sermon and those words that Jonah just sang for us. Well, friends, today marks the beginning of what Christians around the world call Holy Week. During Holy Week, followers of Jesus take time to remember and enter into the events that took place in the days between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. Today we celebrate Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem when Jesus rode into the city and was welcomed as a beloved king by throngs of people. And that's why we're waving those branches. And then over the next few days, our Lord taught and spent time with his disciples. Then on Thursday evening, Jesus joined his followers to celebrate the Passover and to have a final meal with his closest friends, what we now call the Lord's Supper. And he also washed the disciples' feet, giving them an example of service for them to follow. Later that night, Jesus went out to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray because he was in great turmoil as he pondered what awaited him in the coming hours. And then later in that garden, Jesus was betrayed by Judas, arrested by the temple guards, underwent interrogations, and two separate trials before a, a Jewish religious court and then a Roman court, lasting all night long, where he was found guilty of blasphemy by the Jewish court, and of treason by the secular Roman court, both of which were capital offenses. And so Jesus was beaten and abused and whipped and then crucified by Roman soldiers. And he died later that Friday afternoon and was buried in a tomb. But on the third day, on Sunday morning, followers of Jesus went out to the tomb and discovered it was empty. And then Jesus appeared to them, first to the women and then to the disciples. God had raised up Jesus from death. His body had been restored to life, but, but more than that, it had been transformed into a new resurrection body that could be seen and touched, but was somehow different and more glorious. What happened in these eight days from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday changed the world forever. And the power of what God did in Christ that day, those days, can change us too. And that's what makes this week so special for Christians. But let's come back to the story that Denise read for us a moment ago, to the first day of Holy Week when Jesus came into town. Have you ever felt rejected or misunderstood by someone? I'm sure you have. Maybe today, maybe a year ago, maybe a long time ago. But if you've ever felt that way, then you know how Jesus must have felt as his public ministry was coming to an end. The hostility against him had risen to fever pitch. His gentle compassion and his, his astonishing miracles and his thought-provoking teaching had been met with opposition and even violence by many of the religious leaders. And now on this day when Jesus rides into the city of Jerusalem and begins his final week, Jesus knows what none of his friends know. Jesus knows he's about to die. And despite the fleeting attempts of the crowd to make him their king, Jesus chooses another way, a way that no one at that moment could ever have understood. He chooses the way of the cross. It was the time of the Passover festival, 
great crowds had come to Jerusalem, the ancient Jewish historian Josephus estimated that 2.7 million people assembled at the time of the Passover in Jesus' day. Now that's probably something of an exaggeration. But clearly it was a massive festival and there were huge crowds of people there who had gathered with a sense of excitement and celebration and anticipation. The Jewish people were, were waiting for their Messiah, their Savior to come. They were looking for a human king, someone like King David, who would free them from their enemies. And as Jesus enters Jerusalem, he is seen by many to be that coming king. What did we just say in the scripture reading? Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the king of Israel. That's what they shouted. But those were dangerous words. The crowd probably saw Jesus as a military king and were hoping for immediate liberation from Roman rule, their pagan occupiers. In the days of Jesus, there were different groups of Jewish people who had different attitudes toward the government of their day, kind of like in Canada today. <laughs> the Pharisees, the Pharisees took the view that the Roman occupation, oppressive though it was, had to be endured until God himself removed it. So they were fairly passive. The Sadducees, who were the ruling elites, the wealthiest people, the, the, the family of the high priest in the temple in Jerusalem, they believed in cooperating with the Roman government. They didn't want to rock the boat because they were on top. The zealots, on the other hand, were a revolutionary political religious movement in those days who wanted to a violent revolution to overthrow the Romans and install a new messianic king that had come from God. Imagine Jesus walking into all those expectations. And so now here comes Jesus riding into the city during all this excitement and anticipation that maybe God was about to do a new thing to free his people from tyranny and oppression. Jesus is indeed the king. But notice he doesn't ride into Jerusalem triumphantly, powerfully in a military chariot or riding some war horse. He's a different kind of leader. How did Jesus come in? The text says in verse 15, See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. He came humbly, gently, sitting on a baby donkey. He is the messianic king, but not a military one. By doing what he did coming into the city, Jesus was performing what we might call an acted parable. A deliberate, symbolic, public action to dramatically call attention to the spiritual message he was wanting to communicate. This acted parable of coming in as the king, fulfilling many of the messianic expectations, but riding on a donkey of peace instead of a horse of war, was designed to correct the misguided expectations of the crowd and show Jerusalem the way to true peace. Friends, I've titled my sermon today the the paradoxes of Palm Sunday, and believe me, there are a lot of paradoxes to be seen in these words. Jesus came as the victorious king, not by doing violence to others or doing violence to the Roman oppressors, but by having violence done to him. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, and yet he's talking about what? The cross. And he'll say in a few verses, just after what Denise read for us in verse 32, I, when I am lifted up from the earth, 
will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. So the victory of Jesus came not through military force, but through his self-sacrificial death, which defeated the demonic powers. The death of Jesus signifies God's judgment of this, on the sins of the world, the overthrow of evil. And by lifting Jesus up on the cross, an action that will draw all people to him. So friends, here's a very different kind of victorious king. Jesus not only fulfills the prophecies about the messianic king who was coming, he also fulfilled Isaiah's ancient prophecies about the suffering servant. And he brought those two lines of prophecy together in himself. Now, okay, pull out your three by five note card in your imagination and write down, how would you define the word paradox? Don't worry, I don't want to ask you out loud. <laughs> According to the dictionary, a paradox is a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or idea that when investigated or explained proves to be true. These two seemingly conflicting ideas somehow reflect what's real and right and true. And friends, here's one of the paradoxes of Palm Sunday, that the Messiah and the King of this world is also the one who suffers and is a servant to others. That's a paradox that lies right at the heart of our Christian faith and right at the heart of who Jesus is. Jesus is Lord, but the Lord is a servant of all. Human wisdom would never have linked those two ideas together. The crowds of Jewish people formed a parade, lining the streets with palm branches and shouting Hosanna and celebrating Christ's triumphal entry into the city. They were hailing Jesus as their king. But as you probably recall, their enthusiasm didn't last very long, did it? Not least of all, because Jesus apparently wasn't interested in parades or popularity. The only thing Jesus was interested in was what God wanted for his life. And that fact becomes abundantly clear in the next part of the story that Denise read for us. It begins with this request of some non-Jewish, God-believing Greeks who want to see Jesus. Their request is passed on to Jesus by Philip and Andrew. And when, the, and when the text next says, Jesus answered them, it's not entirely clear who the them is. Is it the, the, the Greeks or is it, or is it Philip and Andrew? But at any rate, before you know it, just two sentences into Jesus' response, he is talking about, of all things, this one who's just ridden into the capital of Israel and triumph as their king, he's talking about death. Look at verse 24. Jesus says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Well, now, for anybody associated with agriculture or gardening, in some ways, this statement would be one of the, those penetrating glimpses into the obvious. Seeds are planted. Seeds that are buried eventually sprout new life. We see that truth every winter and spring, don't we? Irene and I saw it yesterday as we drove out to Waterloo County for, the, for a day, and we saw fields of winter wheat beginning to sprout up out of that barren ground, little flecks of green. You could call it a law of nature. Death is essential for the increase of life. That's the way things work in nature in general, which is easy enough to understand, I guess. 
But what is not so easy to understand was the whole idea that this would be precisely the way things Jesus work, the, the way things work in Jesus' life. His death would result in an increase of life. This was the claim which for many people seemed unnatural, if not absurd. It was difficult for people to grasp. But friends, this is what I want us to note. When these God-believing Greeks wanted to see Jesus, what was it Jesus wanted them to see most clearly about himself? What was the one thing he wanted them to know? He wanted them to see that out of death, out of his death, would come much life. He wanted them to see that he was the king of kings, but the only crown he was interested in wearing was a crown of thorns. He wanted them to see that as the Lord of Lords, his coronation, his exaltation would take place when he was lifted up, not on some grand throne in a castle or a cathedral, but when he was lifted up and nailed to a Roman cross between two thieves at the outskirts of town near the garbage dump. Friends, what we're dealing with here is another Palm Sunday paradox that takes us to the very heart of the good news. Jesus mentions other paradoxes in his ministry. Think about it. He says we can find our lives by losing them. He says we can save our lives by spending them and pouring them out on other people. And this paradox could be summarized by the phrase, living by dying. It isn't simply a law of nature. It was the guiding principle of Jesus' life. It was the way things operated for him on earth. And truth be told, it's the way things work for those who would follow Jesus too. In other words, living by dying is not just a law of nature, it's also a law of discipleship. Jesus basically says that in verse 25, those who love their lives lose it, but those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. He's talking about living by dying. It's a profound paradox of following Jesus. So friends, the point I'm trying to make is that Jesus is not only talking about his own death and life here, he's talking about the life and death of all of us who would follow him. The life and death of his disciples. He's talking about our life and death, about our living and dying. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think Jesus means that we're supposed to engage in self-sabotage to make our lives harder than they need to be. I heard once about a charity in the developing world that once refused to have hot water heat put into their building even though the donors had already paid for that because they believed that there was extra virtue in having to put up with just cold water. Now, depending on where you are in the world, cold water might be a great gift, but I know I don't like it when I get into the shower first thing in the morning. That's not what it means to hate your life, just to, just to choose to suffer a little bit more. Instead, I think what Jesus means is that following his way will sometimes be hard work. It'll require some difficult choices. It means that at one time or another, there's going to be a cost involved. As a result, sometimes when we follow his commands, life seems to go less well for us in this world. It'll even look maybe to some like we hate our lives. Because we do in the sense that Jesus intends here, 
We love those other things less because we love Him more. So whenever there's a conflict between what Jesus calls us to do and what will go better for us in terms of some temporal gain of money or prestige or power or whatever, then we're invited to follow Jesus and put His priorities first. Let's go back to that example of that charity in the developing world. If there was another charity nearby that also needed a hot water heater and only one of them were available, it certainly would be right and good for, the, for those people to say, give it to them. We'll do without for a little while longer. That's Christian love. We've had a Bible study online going uh, at Claire Lee Park for the last few weeks. We just finished last Wednesday night, and we've been studying the book of Philippians. And there's one passage that keeps coming back to me. And I think it describes this kind of love that Jesus is calling us to. From Philippians 2, verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. Friends, I know it's hard to live that way. It's hard to let go of wanting to sit in the driver's seat of life and letting Jesus and the needs of others set the agenda of how we're meant to live. Seems like a lot of people are interested today in God and in faith only for what they can get out of it. They wonder, what's in it for me? It's like the saying I came across recently was on a bumper sticker. It said, if God is my co-pilot, can I use the carpool lane? <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> Even our faith can become something that is more about us than it is about God or other people. But Jesus hears the question, what's in it for me? And his answer is self-denial, death. I want you to notice how Jesus finishes off this passage with a parting reminder. He says in verse 26, Whoever serves me must follow me. But let's never ever forget that when Jesus said those words, he was headed straight for the cross. My dear sisters and brothers, eternal life begins right now when we start dying to ourselves and living for others. And forever starts today. Let's pray. Loving God, we bless you for the gift of your word. We pray now for the grace to believe what we have heard and to live in ways that honor you above all. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Friends, let's now sing our praise selection number 217, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty. Let's remain seated as we sing this and ponder what we're singing about.
as we present our offerings to the Lord, let's stand and sing the doxology. Jesus was lifted up from earth. Draw us into your heart for this world which you love. And use our gifts that all creation may be brought from bondage to freedom, from darkness to light, from death to life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Last week, I had the joy of, of visiting at the St. Josephat Ukrainian Catholic Cathedral over in the west end of Toronto. One of our members who wasn't able to get out herself had ten bags of clothes, women's clothes, that she, she wanted to give that this Ukrainian Catholic Church was collecting partly for refugees who are now arriving here with almost nothing uh, but the clothes on their back, and also for sending back to Ukraine and where the refugees are located in Poland and Hungary and the other nations. So when I came, I, I wore my clergy collar. I don't usually wear that during the week, but I was since I was walking into a Catholic church, I thought I should. and. Uh, the first thing that Father Volodymyr said to me, he, big guy, and he reached out his arms and said, my brother in Christ. <laughs> and he gave me a big hug. And I told him that the people of our congregation were praying for Ukraine and were grieving the pain and the suffering and the loss that the, the Ukrainians around the world are facing, especially those in the homeland, but also here in Canada too. And with tears in his eyes, he said, thank you. And please tell your people, keep praying for us. That was his one word, keep praying for us. So we pray today for our friends and loved ones and brothers and sisters in Ukraine who are suffering. And also have been asked by, by Annette Bisnath, Annette's sister, Sita, is having surgery tomorrow. Let's remember Sita in our prayers. Let's pray to the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, you were lifted up on the cross for us and for our salvation. Help us, Lord, to triumph over evil and to do good, to give ourselves to you as you gave yourself for us. Lord of the church, may we bring others to know you and in knowing you to love you and in loving you to serve you. Bless, O oh God, the continued outreach of this congregation through Alpha and prayer and Bible studies and fellowship gatherings and through our weekly worship. May the name of Jesus be lifted up. We pray for those, Lord, involved in mission and outreach around the world, for the Presbyterian Church in Canada, for the Latin America mission, for other agencies of relief and of caring. We pray especially, Lord, here at home for Evangel Hall and the ministry of Urban Promise and other organizations and missions and groups of Christians who are seeking to reach out 
and share your love with others. O oh Christ, you were broken on the cross and we draw near to you as we recall, O oh God, the brokenness of our world, the depth of despair that so many in Ukraine are feeling now. And we pray, O oh God, for the people of Ukraine. And we pray for the people of Russia who suffer in different ways. Bring an end to this conflict, we pray. Cease this war. We pray, O oh God, that in your mercy, that you would inspire your people around the world to reach out in practical ways and in our prayers to remember those who are suffering and to come to their assistance as we are able. O oh God, we remember all those who have been generous to us, all who have shared their resources and their lives with us. We pray for parents who sacrificed for us for the giving of their time and their attention. We're also mindful, Lord, for those who have been denied love, for those who have been deprived of well-being and are affected by that. We remember today children who are in foster care, who've been taken into shelter because their, home or their homes are places that are not safe. Lord, we lift them up to you. In these days, O oh God, of Holy Week, we give thanks for the passion and the cross of our Lord Jesus, for the gift of redemption. We pray for all those troubled souls, those who are anxious about their health or their future. We lift up to you those, O oh God, who are persecuted for their beliefs or their principles, for those who are suffering at this time. Especially, Lord, we lift up Sita, Annette's sister, as she faces surgery tomorrow. We pray that the surgery will go well and that you might touch Sita's body and restore her to full health. Lord, grant comfort to the bereaved, give, give courage to the dying. We pray for all who are sorrowing, and we lift them up to you, Lord, to minister th to them as only you can. And hear us now, O God, as we pray the prayer Jesus taught his followers to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. We stand and sing our final song of praise, My Song is Love Unknown, number 220.
selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, friends, may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.